Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our fifth session of our auspicious event, Focus Next India, sponsored by CVU and Beta Tester. As the main motto of this event is to create awareness among students, we present you this instructive and honorable live session with a spectacular personality. The topic today we're going to talk about is tackling human trafficking and self-defense. Today, we have an inspiring woman with us who has been a social entrepreneur working, working for more than 30 years to provide sustainable livelihood in a safe environment for women and children. Before we welcome her onto the screen, let us know about her remarkable journey. I dream to dance with the tide. I am fulfilling someday. Let this be the epilogue to my life. When somebody accepts a job somewhere or accepts some opportunity, it's not that they really want to be enslaved or caught into a sexual exploitation. She wants to better money. Yes, everybody wants better option in life, better opportunity in life. But nobody wants to be sold. My name is Hasina Karbi. I'm 47 years old. I am from Meghalaya and born and brought up in Shillong. I would call myself a human rights defender. Impulse NGO Network um, evolved over the last 26 years. A collective response to engage both the private and the public to come together to intervene uh, to address human trafficking. There's so many unreported cases. There would be more than you know, uh, 80 to 90,000 of cases from across the eight states of the northeast of India that we've been working. And that is amazingly really, really high in terms of the people coming from this region. As an individual, I took the first step, the bold step to say, any girls that you find from the Northeast, please let us know. And uh, that step led, you know, from two cases to three to four. And in the course of 30 years now, we have more than 74,000 cases that the organization has dealt. When we started to work on the issue, I would say that uh, women from the region because of lack of economic opportunities, we're moving out of the region for job opportunities. Today, the social media and the uh, internet is far reached to every villages that people are looking as the best option and how beautiful it would be to get out of the region. We have seen that girls from the Northeast are no longer going to different states in India like Mumbai or Calcutta or Bangalore. They're going Southeast Asia. Now, our states in the region, we are bordering China, we are bordering uh, Myanmar, we're bordering uh, you know, Bangladesh in large way. We have the chicken neck, you know, uh, which is also connecting to Nepal. Most of the connectivity is by road, by bus. And the second connectivity that takes people uh, from the different part of the Northeast now is Gohati is a train station that leads people to get out of the different parts of the Northeast. Many family does not really understand that going out of the region can actually make the young girl or the young women unsafe because they have not really understood the gravity that at the destination point getting a job is just not getting a job. It's who's giving that job and what is the facilities in that job and what is the safety in that job. That is, you know, the gap of understanding. Family allow because they didn't realize that that would, you know, let them to be vulnerable. There has to be economic opportunities um, in the spaces that women and girls come from, whether we are talking about a rural context or we are talking about an urban context. Because that is an option where economic viability make them have more strength uh, not to accept you know, opportunities outside 
which will make them vulnerable. The secret of my success is identifying change makers in the respective communities that we work, whether it's states in the Northeast, uh, the neighboring countries championing their leadership uh, to accept that we can collectively come together uh, to address the issue of human trafficking. That was such a great video, which clearly depicts that Hasina Mam started out as a mission in her own state, Nakalaya, which today evolved into a global program that aims to put an end to human trafficking and exploitation worldwide. There are 72,795 number of cases that Impulse NGO working has collectively intervened in under Impulse model through partnership over the last 26 years. The organization and building capacity across the borders with passion and professionalism. All adding into the reduce the demand and supply of human sport trafficking and put an end to sexual exploitation and forced labor worldwide. Here we have Hasina Ma'am to interact with us and share her insight to inspire us. With all due respect, let's welcome Ms. Hasina Kirby onto the screen. Thank you, everyone. It's lovely to be part of this process, and I hope to be able to interact and answer most of the questions that everybody would like to know more about what is the issue of, you know, on human trafficking and what happened. Thomas, congratulations to your achievements on behalf of my team, ma'am. So, ma'am, how do you feel about inspiring a lot of people uh, to be brave and fight against the human trafficking? I think when I started it off, I started it because I believe strongly on the issue and uh, it was a step towards the belief and a step towards making changes that no human being should be exploited because we all have human rights and our rights has to be protected. That journey took shape in terms of the larger involvement of many individuals that came together from the Northeast believing on the vision of Impulse NGO Network and taking it more as a deeper meaning in their own life uh, to end slavery. And I think that was one of the step one to the aspiration of each one of them, wanting to do something for the communities, wanting to address human rights exploitation. And we all came together and the involvement and the steps of intervention led to the birth of Impulse Model, which stands on 12 pillars. Such an excellent words, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, what was the driving force that made you to stick to your passion uh, for fighting for women and children? Uh, when your passion goes beyond yourself and it becomes an integral part of rights. And uh, when you start understanding that if I have to achieve my own human rights and I would like people who are not having access to human rights to actually have access to justice, that become an integral part of, you know, the belief that I have. And that belief itself took me uh, to 31 years of my life. And I've, when I look back, I just don't realize that I, 31 years has passed by. And uh, it's not a single person work. It is very much a team as an organization that evolved over the years. I might be the forefront person that emerged as in the passionate, but I, I also believe that the team that are part of the organization are passionately enough. You know, I mean, moreover, I would say that they are in this drive because they're passionate about what they are doing. And there is an integral part of their passion that demonstrate their strength, their understanding, and their, you know, I support system to the model. I'm sure, ma'am, students are going to know more about it from today's session. Okay, ma'am, without any ado, let us dive on to the uh, session. So, ma'am, we have a few questions waiting for you. Hope this session will be great. And uh, let's uh, move on to the session, ma'am. All right. Look forward to those questions. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, can you explain what is impulse model and what are six P's and six R's? Uh, impulse model is an innovation that evolved out of an action that we had intervened to address human trafficking. 
And impulse model innovation is tested, you know, from a step-to-step engagement of cases of women and girls that has been trafficked and exploited. The intervention from the legal lens strengthen the innovation, which is called impulse model. And that give birth to the six P's and six R. So the six P's and six R brings together the public and the private party engagement providers under one umbrella. Because engagement of service providers under, under one umbrella always emerge as a successful end-to-end solution in addressing human rights violation against women and girls and other gender who have been exploited because of human trafficking and slavery and all form of slavery. So the impulse model six P's is actually a system change, engaging scaling up of policies, engagement, addressing the legalities of those policy engagement, whether we are talking about UN protocols, that is the lead point and the constitutional right of the countries that we work, starting with the country that we started off, which is in India, and we have scaled out to Nepal, Bangladesh, and Myanmar uh, for the last 12 years. Uh, I mean, subsequently, eight years in Myanmar, and you know, in, in India, we are more than 25 years taking this model forward. Every case help us to dive deep uh, as we were scaling deep, which is the six R. So the six R, which is report, rescue, rehabilitation, repatriation, reintegration, and restitution, is actually the legalities uh, in a simplified manner in terms of the action that requires and the coordination that is required from a single window platform and a shared resources. Very often, a lot of organization work in isolation. A lot of leaders takes their passion in addressing the cases of human trafficking, which is extremely wonderful, extremely needed everywhere. But if we have to see an end-to-end solution, we need to engage collectively. So what we did was our learning lesson that we had on the ground, trying to intervene in our initial years, led us to focus on a collective leadership. So the six R is the action of collective leadership where it focuses through the introduction of a software and technology platform that emerged in 2012 when we got the world prize uh, from the Japanese most innovative development project under the World Bank. And this has also led to making case and data management an essentiality of a, fa- a better legal processes action. And of course, technology is always emerging and it cannot be stagnant. And we are all moving ahead to upgrading every time that we are encountering new cases, which is challenging us. The six Ps is mainly, uh, this, I would say the system, uh, which includes all stakeholders uh, engaging more in a convergence manner. Because sometimes when we look at the government, the ministries or the departments, they also have their work towards addressing human trafficking in multiple ways, but there's no convergence. So what we try to do is understanding the linkages of convergence that applies within this, you know, the six Ps, which is partnership, prevention, protection, policing, and prosecution, and also taking the action, which is a six R. So that is more comprehensive. So it allow the uh, support system uh, and also shared resources to make the work towards addressing uh, human trafficking much more effective. Uh, ma'am, uh, what does anti-human trafficking mean to impulse? Uh, c- could you just repeat that question? What is anti- Anti-human trafficking mean to impulse? Well, uh, when we talk about anti-human trafficking, uh, it's basically the unit. I think the anti-human trafficking unit, which has been set up by the Ministry of Home Affairs, uh, which actually came into existence because of many organizations like us in the country came together 15 years ago to see that the involvement of the Ministry of Home Affairs is an essentiality and having directive of every state that the law enforcement has a special unit that actually address human trafficking. Because unless until the special unit is engaged, 
uh, in terms of the connecting point, then you don't see the, uh, you know, because a lot of people don't have a better understanding on human trafficking. It, it requires yeah. a coordinated effort. So th- we work very closely with the anti-human trafficking unit, which she called it the mm-hmm. AHT in short. And that has emerged over the years. And this is an action by the government of India that responded to the need of um, civil society organization like us and others who are also working together as partners in the country when we see that there has to be a specialized unit. And that has also led to the anti-trafficking bill, you know, which is yet uh, you know, to be passed, uh, which is also looking at how a bill can bring a comprehensive way of addressing human trafficking, which sometimes gets sidelined uh, you know, when we look at it from the crime perspective. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, what are the measures that uh, Indus NGO took against uh, self-defense? And self-defense was very important when we talk about the human trafficking. Uh, when, we, when we look at the word self-defense, self-defense is an essentiality of each and every one of us when it comes of how we defend ourselves from being exploited. We often feel that you know, self-defense requirement is for people below poverty line or self-defense is for people who, who are actually economically unsound. But today, when we talk mm-hmm. about human trafficking, uh, the new challenges, self-defense is also required for each and every one, even people who are highly educated, young people who are using a lot of technology, you know, which is at the click of the button. And in the past two years, because of COVID-19, I think technology has become a part and parcel of our life. Like here we are, I'm talking from my home in Shillong uh, to the rest of all the communities and young people who are listening to me today. It would have not been this way in the past, right? Technology would have been often used only at a certain level, but today technology has become part and parcel. But we need to have a self-defense to understand, you know, the... The, I mean, the challenges that technology also brings to us in terms yeah. of the good and the bad, and also the, the need for technology and where do we draw the line? You know, I mean, so much of technology availability and lesser understanding of the usage also yeah. can create a lot of challenges. And that having said that, many of the cases that we are starting to deal with happens to be trafficking that happen online through social media, social spaces, dating apps, and all new forms of technology platform, which is emerging as a connecting point or a marketing platform or an educational platform. So, you know, so there's the good side of technology and there's also the challenging side of technology. And to bridge that gap, we need to self-defense understanding. So self-defense for me uh, would also see the variation of how technology is engaging in the more positive manner and how sound am I in the way I use it and how educated am I and how do I seek to educate myself so that I can defend myself from being exploited. Exactly, ma'am. In present scenario, we can see uh, how the technology is being used and how it can be used in a bad manner also. Ma'am, uh, how I mean, how have you been able to start all this alone and manage the organization for years? Uh, it started with a single step. As a young person at 17, I never thought that I would create Impulse NGO Network as an institution. The institution was born out of me and my group of friends that thought we should do something more for the community that we are actually interacting through our school program called the Leadership Training Services, way then when I was at St. Joseph School. That program led to the institution, uh, which is Impulse NGO Network. The institution grew over the years. And I would say, as young people, we learn and unlearned. Uh, We educated ourselves. We built our capacity to run an institution. So I would say Impulse NGO Network is a response to a need that we felt we need to bring change in the community that we are actually working and interacting. And that is how the organization was built. But once you have an organization, you have to follow all the legalities of running an institution or a nonprofit. 
And as you follow that, uh, you have to build structures and you have to build policy that engages in the right manner. Because sometimes you run an organization without the legal structure in place, uh, then you also can go wrong in the way you perform any kind of human rights uh, you know, issues that then it means you are doing it at a single level. You're not doing it from an institutional level. And as an institution, uh, the focus was to build more other organization to also be institution uh, where they have leadership that actually believe on the same vision that we have. So that is how the organization grew over the years. Uh, Ma'am, I heard about Magic Box program. So uh, can you tell me what is Magic Box and what is the relevance in nowadays? All right. So I would say um, the Magic Box program is an initiative that uh, I started off and introduced through Impulse NGO Network when I was serving as a Commonwealth Youth Ambassador from India way back in 2004 to 2006. It's an initiative that actually led to uh, more communication on sexual health and drug issues. And the fact that during those days, the use of internet or the availability of the internet space and technology space was not very much available. And uh, technology came way much later, uh, which we have today. So the magic box is uh, a box that is kept in every school that we were intervening in the state of Meghalaya. And the reason of giving that a magic box was basically that any question you ask anonymously, uh, you are having answers, which is magical uh, to the core of what you want to know. So we started intervening uh, sexual health, sex education uh, through this magic box where answers right. are being actually put up in the, the notice board of the school and you know the teachers on health who is not being able to communicate to the student more openly to talk about you know issues that are very sensitive, which is stigmatized, opening up that dialogue uh, through the magic box. So, and in fact, the magic box became very popular then, and uh, that's when uh, I was also put together uh, as a Yuva star under the program of the BBC that had a hundred million people watching, and you know, so it becomes more a very popular program. But if you translate the magic box today in today's world, then definitely you'll have to use technology platform that engaging an app, you know, uh, to answer questions anonymously uh, to the concern mm -hmm. of young people. So it's a way how you translate innovation then and now. Yes, ma'am. And uh, nowadays, magic box is very important. In all the schools all over the India, we have to put that. Yes. I think over how the can years, we yeah, over yes, the years, what I've seen is that sexual health, sex education, you know, sexuality is still a question which is not openly discussed. There's always this cultural barrier that actually does not engage a better communication. So even schools and colleges, you know, does not have programs and activities that allow young people to have the correct understanding of sexual health, you know, substance abuse, or any of the concern that today a lot of situation like mental health comes along when people are in distress and not being able to talk about you know, their, their, themselves. So how do we really engage that? So if we translate the magic box then and now, then we need to create an app or bring an app that mm -hmm. actually allows people to be more flexible to ask this question and have the correct answer. Because today you Google, you can, you can have all kinds of answers, which is the correct one, which is the, you know, which is the right one. So unless until you have a streamlined program, uh, which gives you magical answer, then definitely young people will still be curious, you know, of getting to know what is right and what would be good for them and how would they make better, de I mean, decisions. And that will help uh, the people to get tired of the misconception about uh, the sex education. Correct, correct. Ma'am, uh, how can we help when we see someone being trapped in uh, trafficking? Well, the first form is to report back wherever you are mm. uh, at any way, at any platform, any state, any platform, any countries in the world. If you find that somebody is vulnerable because of human trafficking 
and you find that somebody is vulnerable to be exploited. The first step to it is that each one of us take action. And what is that action? Mm -hmm. Help the person uh, with the correct information. And if you don't have the correct information, you know, connect to organizations. Uh, you know, there's a lot of toll free number today that actually allows, uh, you know, to be connected in terms of help. We at Impulse NGO Network, you know, I mean, receives all these, uh, I mean, like, I mean, I would say responses through our emails, through, uh, through our social media messenger, where people wants to know about, you know, the challenges or vulnerability that they would be in accepting maybe a job outside, uh, you know, any kind of queries, which is making them vulnerable. That's an action that each one of us can do. The other one is that today, I think uh, the most important part of it is when we have help in the house, or if our neighbors have help in the house, we need to understand whether those help are exploited or not. Because many of the help today are underage. They are they traffic from communities that are vulnerable or from communities that actually are below economic or communities that are being brought across the border and does not have a voice mm -hmm. to even raise. So they are bonded in terms of exploitation and that is slavery by itself. So that is very important that you reach out. And I think 1098, uh, a toll free number is available in every states in the country. We work very closely with Childline as well. That is the first help that you can just dial the number and say, we found somebody in X house and we felt that this X house is exploiting or it's a child or a girl coming from anywhere. So that's one way of taking a spot action. Um, Ma'am, uh, while doing all these rescue things and all, uh, what are the challenges you faced? Uh, I mean, uh, and what do you learn from this? Uh, today, I mean, when you, when I go back on what I have personally get involved in terms of rescued, and also how the organization has got involved in terms of the network of operationing operating uh, rescue, mm -hmm. is that. Earlier, it used to be rescue from red light area, you know, all kind of brothel which is existing in the country or other countries that they might have been trafficked or rescued from unsafe migration, which are mainly for labor, but then they're exploited into a bonded exploitation. But over the years, the challenging is that uh, brothels and red light areas, you know, are actually, uh, you know, are non-existence. They are more concentrated now online. People are getting exploited online. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the sales of women and girls are happening online. Uh, the use of, you know, platform like the dark web, where it's actually, you know, I mean, used for a purpose of drugs trafficking, arms trafficking is also, uh, you know, using uh, human trafficking and interlinking to that. So it is graduating in a more challenging spaces. Now, when we look and if we look into artificial intelligence of how platforms are using to understand the market space or to push market space, uh, they having traffickers who are using this artificial intelligence to, you know, to lure people, you know, to lure mm -hmm. the vulnerability. So that is where traffickers today are becoming more, you know, and I would say they've upgraded the style that that is a challenge because organization like us has to you know move ahead to learn the new forms of trafficking how to address this new form of trafficking building more collaborative work with cybercrime and these larger you know i mean technology platforms that are actually having social spaces or social engagement and marketing engagement to work together in actually looking that trafficking does not happen in those spaces. It's a new form of challenge. So you really have to upgrade your skill sets. And uh, if we don't, then we cannot be operating in today's world. So, you know, the NGOs, I mean, like us, we are 31 years. So if we decide not to learn the new forms of challenges and upgrade ourselves, then we will not be able to address the issue of human trafficking. Uh, 
uh, ma'am uh, while working on the field uh, it will be very i mean comparing to the technological side as the technology increased and the dark web something will uh, come and so i mean finding or helping the people who trapped over there is bit challenging right i mean um moving comparing to the field experience or uh, moving on to the places that you already know and uh, so how you will i mean change the strategies and all well um strategies uh, has to be changed with time and the way we address uh, the issue also changes with time uh, because of the kind of trafficking scenario and uh, looking at the dimension and scale of the trafficking scenario now over and large i mean the most important element when we talk about human trafficking is that when we dealing with minor then the legal legalities the law allows the mm-hmm. intervention directly because they are minors and children but the moment we have somebody above 18 the the complexities of personal rights women's right come into hand so that is where a thin line comes in today's world that sometime you have cases where women says it's my choice you know i'm here because of my choice but sometime it could it's also the back end of our understanding over the years that when they use the word is my choice it's because they have been exploited for so many years and they don't feel that going back you know has any future for them so they are willing to be there in that space of exploitation rather than going back and face more discrimination you know i would say economic issues so that is one part of the whole nexus of how human trafficking happen and the challenge for us on the ground is that uh when we have to intervene the sensitivity uh the understanding and the experiences so what is very important is that more and more organization has evolved in many years now addressing the issue of human trafficking and exploitation but it's also very critical and important that they work together with organization who've had many years of experiences so combine the new learning and you know the experiences it helps to bring better strategies because if you know organization will experience a new organization that evolved uh, in addressing the issue works in isolation then there's the defeat of reinventing the wheel so that's a very important mm-hmm. element that one needs to to understand that we don't need to reinvent the wheel but we rather need to plug in uh the technical support uh the engagement the new learnings and see that uh we are addressing uh much much more uh stronger than traffickers who are using these platforms and a new technology and new forms of exploitation so it's basically working against uh traffickers who are using platform that are uh, you know engaging you know a, a, a multi billion industry and that is something that we are fighting back with that so unless until we bring system change and others it become challenging so we need to have that understanding of working together uh ma'am uh, how you dealt with the threat calls while working against the rat hole mine i think the the journey with the rat hole mining in the state of meghalaya uh happens because we were intervening with a case of human trafficking that was of a girl who was traffic and uh when we were trying to do home investigation and mapping mm-hmm. uh, the family from where she comes from it actually opened a window of the rat hole mining that was existing in the state that I come from and where I grew up and the state that where it was work was originated now having to see the gravity of an unscientific mining and we try to really map address uh in a very uh legal manner so doing that means understanding the environmental challenges understanding the human right violation understanding that an unscientific mining was actually engaging traffic children from across the border so as we are using the legal framework Uh, and the UN protocol that India is signatory to it and also taking different steps of mapping and research which is collaborative in nature we try to bring the system and the government uh, to actually takes action and uh, in the process of that we knew that when we 
we filed a public interest litigation uh, in the National mm -hmm. Green Tribunal and we got the closure of the mine. That journey mm -hmm. was already, you know, battling against the most powerful people, you know, who, which has a nexus of itself, the nexus of the political people and as well as the nexus of, you know, the whole coal mafia. And that where Impulse as an organization faced many challenges and me as an individual who was leading the whole foremost mm -hmm. initiative and campaign and action, I was asked uh, through threatening calls that went on for a while that I should stop and stay back and not intervene. And having not listened to all the trite, I mean, challenge that came along, the threatening call that came along, I was attacked. And uh, there were several attacks. And uh, the last attack was that my driver died on the spot. So uh, I escaped that. So I, I know looking back at it, when you're dealing with mafias and the nexus of crime, then uh, we always face these kind of challenges, which are not very easy. And uh, human rights defenders across the world who are working on crime issues, uh, especially when you're a woman, you know, the kind of challenges uh, you would be facing is multiple. Uh, comparatively. So that is where uh, the challenges came. But I think uh, the challenges made me more uh, structured. And uh, I would say that I think the blessing of many of those rescued survivors and children that we work with has led me to come forward and say, I will continue to do what I do, because I believe that everyone has a human right and the access to justice is equal for everybody. Ma'am, uh, your braveness is appreciable. Uh, Ma'am, uh, how did you deal with a woman or a child who is suffering a trauma or trafficking, human trafficking? Uh, well, every girl and every children and every young boys that we have dealt from the various forms of human trafficking. Of course, initially, I was very much personally involved in every cases. But as the organization mm -hmm. grew over the years, the team, the case manager, of mm -hmm. course, we have a case manager with us who's been actively working for the last eight years with the cases. Mm -hmm. I'm very much in touch with all the crucial matters that needs, you know, I would say advices or suggestions on how to deal is that mm -hmm. we need to detach ourselves from, you know, dealing with cases if you have to deal with many, many cases, because the moment you get emotionally attached to a case, then uh, you personally cannot perform, you know, larger intervention and more cases because we are human being. We have to know that, you know, the person who's sharing his or her trauma to you, the person who's observing is a person who have to take more of that trauma. And if you do mm -hmm. that without detachment, then what happened, you will not be able to go a long way. And we find that with many human rights defenders across the world that they get exhausted, they get burned out because of the, the consequences of being the listener to this kind of trauma. Mm -hmm. Because trauma is, you know, it comes to you when you're listening. The person who's speaking let out her or his trauma to you. So this is an important element that we as an organization and the impulse model over the years has always make sure that the team, the partners, the collective partners engage in detaching from that emotional mm. engagement and looking at more from the legalities of rights. So that helped because then when the gravity of importance of counseling and psychological support, then we always connect to psychologists who can give the uh, skill I mean, help, you know, that is needed. So that's an important element of adaptation that we had. Ma'am, uh, as you are a writer, who inspires you? And uh, what books do you suggest a woman to get aware and get stronger? Well, I would say um, I have, I would, I would say what gets stronger. I always loved to write from the time I was in school. And... Um, I, I write because I feel it's a form of expressing oneself. I started off with poetry because I think it was a form of communicating my inner self. And that communication of my inner self lets me to be more communicable to the world. And uh, it is a hobby that grew to be 
you know, engaging me over the years, I would say in the last few years, uh, I mean, in, in, I've not been so active as I used to be, but I'm with COVID, I've come back uh, to, you know, write more poetries. But I think when I look back at poetry that I wrote then when I was in school and now, I think I have graduated, I've matured a lot in what I write. And I think the experiences of life makes you write, you know, uh, the literature of, of what you want to, you know, the untold, meaningful, you know, communication experiences in the form of poetry. So that's one part of it. And I would say um, books, I mean, you know, it started like when I went, when I was a, a school, st- I mean, school student, uh, I love reading Enid Blyton, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and then it started off from there and it went, so you grow up and you uh, engage yourself in uh, books that gives you more meaningful to life, right? So I, I would say that for me, books reading, it depends on which portion of your life are you in, you know, because authors sometimes are people who engage in what you see yourself and how you want to see yourself, right? And every author has different ways of expressing their, um, you know, their experiences, uh, whether fictional or unfictional, uh, the stories and the way they would capture, you know? So that is something that I will not say that a specific author is the right author because each one of us has our way of engaging our reading And that depends on what stages of our life are we in and how does that reading engages us. Now, if I say then and now, you know, I started reading more of books, you know, uh, by, you know, I mean, I mean, I would say the Dalai Lama and others because I was engaging more in a lot of meditative uh, spaces Mm -hmm. for myself. It's basically detachment, disengaging my mind Mm -hmm. that, you know, I might have everything around me, but I should learn how to disengage myself as well. <coughs> so that's what I would say, you know, as far as books is concerned. So I will not say a particular author that you should concentrate. Whoever is listening to me today, each one of, your, each one of you will definitely uh, attach yourself to an author at different stages of your life. And... Um, and that would mean that it is the engagement of what you went through and how you want to see and what you want to learn about life. And for me, the Dalai Lama is more about, um, you know, disengaging. You know, it's, it's very more on, I'm not religious, but Buddhism for me is a way of life and the way I've been practicing on what I do. So I think uh, that's how I've been reading books nowadays. <laughs> Ma'am, uh, can you listen, you know, any of your poems? Right now, which one do you want me to? I think there's so many of them, you know, at the moment. But um, at the spur of now, I know which one would I really want to engage myself um, would be quite a, should we conclude? I mean, I think the the film you shot, right, when you started mm-hmm. off, that was poetry itself. And that's the poem itself that sets the tone of the discussion today. Mm-hmm. which I said, Dancing with the Tides, right? So that's what it started off. That was my poem, the, the film that you showed. Uh, you know, wow. I got my, so that was my starting poem. So I think we can take that poem as the dialogue of today's discussion. <laughs> okay, ma'am. Ma'am, so uh, after listening to you all, I, I don't have words for your braveness and we respect you, ma'am, for all you did and we inspire you. Ma'am, uh, yeah, our live chat is really uh, very active. So with all this lively energy, ma'am, shall we take the questions from the audience? Yes, surely, surely. I love to answer from the live chats and the questions that they have. So we ask, now we begin the Q&A session. Get hyped up and let your queries run into your mind. 
So let's what is check the out first question. Okay, what is the first question? Let's check, ma'am. It will be shown on the screen. Ma'am, what are the main reasons for human trafficking in our country? When there's a demand, there's always a supply, you know. And uh, if it's just not our country, but it's the entire world, some country are a source, a destination, and a transit. And some country is majorly a source. So if there's demand for cheap labor, then trafficking for cheap labor takes place. And if you're looking at COVID-19, what had hit the business communities in the world, unless we are conscious and ethically conscious on the human rights basis, then we will try to engage cheap labor without questioning ourselves mm -hmm. and businesses that we run that whether they are traffic uh, victims or mm -hmm. not. That is how demand takes place. Secondly, sexual exploitation is always of the highest and people, they feel the power of, you know, of basically buying sex, whether it's online, that is engaging so much at the moment. Uh, earlier, it would be, you know, children below the age of 18, uh, where they, you know, they're being exploited and how they're being trafficked to sexual exploitation in the red light area and brothel. But even now, we find that children are highly vulnerable uh, and are highly used in terms of exploitation mm -hmm. online. So that is how human trafficking is. Uh, in our country, as well as globally. But if you're looking at the two years of the situation mm -hmm. of what India faced in terms of a lot of migrant laborers returning back to the source point who from the different cities in the country, we are completely aware that how this country has functioned over the years, that we have huge migrant population leaving their home and leaving their agricultural lands to work in these metropolitan cities. But when COVID strike, these businesses never took any responsibility because there was no human right or fair trade engagement in these kind of businesses that people had no roof and no food, you know? So that is also a form that how unsafe migration or migration for work sometime can make people vulnerable to human trafficking. Uh, Ma'am, uh, did any time you felt like uh, our country is more vulnerable uh, in human trafficking comparing to the foreign countries? Well, uh, we work in four multiple countries. We work in partnership in Southeast Asia. Uh, the demand and supply side continue to happen uh, because of mm -hmm. the need, whether it is cheap labor for construction, mm -hmm. cheap labor for mm -hmm. the food industry, uh, mm -hmm. and also women used into the wellness mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it depends on how these uh, demand and supply, you know, takes place. Mm -hmm. And unless until the business communities or the people who are engaged in businesses are conscious to ask these questions that the people we engage, are they traffic? Are they exploited? Mm -hmm. Are they actually brought by placement agency to be exploited? So this is, is something that we have to break the ice. Uh, we have mm -hmm. a lot of laws in the country. We have a lot of laws that actually you know takes care of all these forms of exploitation mm -hmm. but we need to report more we need as communities as individuals to report when we see any kind of exploitation and come forward then so only we can actually break the circle of the supply side mm -hmm. ma'am let's check the next question What measures do you think uh, should be taken when someone is facing online harassment? Well, we need to demarcate uh, and list what kind of online harassment. So let me just give you one very simple um, example. Online harassment happen when sometime we have friend lists in our social media spaces mm. of the unknown people. If today we find that these people are harassing us for whatever, you should just block them completely. Two is that do not accept friend requests from the unknown. I know that sometime when your social media spaces are public uh, space, right? It's uh, because some of us has a public account. That also you disengage from any form of harassment. Mm -hmm. uh, you report back. I mean, if it's Facebook, you can report this harassment by pressing the button. 
so that mm-hmm. it is engaged. Uh, so these are simple steps. But if the gravity that the person goes beyond uh, from mm-hmm. where you try to stop, you should always report back to the law enforcement at the cyber crime. That's an important element. So even if you go to the side of the ministry, right, they have the cyber thing. So you can always get into the unit of the states that you come from and immediately call. And you can also call the store free of the police that you having this harassment and file a complaint. Uh, next question. Ma'am, how can we improve our self-defense ability? What are the basic things that should be added in our routine? Well, self-defense, one is physical and one is mental. You know, the mental part is uh, how well we are training our mind to disengage from the unproductive Mm -hmm. spaces of the online or the pressure that comes you know, to prove ourselves online, right? Because today there's so much push factor on that. Uh, That's Mm -hmm. a mental way of self-defense that you disengage from it, you disengage in the most productive way while you're engaging in the more productive way. That's one way of self-defense of the mind. So I would, I use the word Mm -hmm. self-defense of the mind. Somebody might give me, let's say, comment on Mm -hmm. your Instagram and, um, you get so hurt and so disappointed, right? Either you block that comment and yeah. stop it there and don't get affected with it. But if you engage in that comment, then you're not defending your mental health at all because then you're getting affected. So that is when you start training your mind not to disengage. The other is that people uh, you know, might start abusing you online, right? The first step is disengage stop, you know, block. That's the best way of self-defense. Then it means you're you're not allowing anybody to enter your mental space. You're having a self-defense on that. The physical Mm -hmm. physical, uh, self-defense, it's about your day-to-day and how safe you are, you know, that you are, you know, engaging yourself, traveling late, traveling to spaces, it's everywhere, right? So I would say there it's it's a necessity. It's just not for women or, you know, young girls or, you know, all gender, you know, to learn some self-defense skills, right? I mean, self-defense skill is about keeping yourself active uh, in terms mm-hmm. of your physical health because physical health is an important element of an overall health. So whether we pick up any form of physical activities that helps that we drive an energy to defend ourselves is always very important. You know, and today there's many, many kind of physical uh, engagement, exercises and others that keeps you fit to be able to defend yourself, right? So that is important. So it's not necessary that all of us go and learn, you know, uh, self-defense classes mm. or you go and learn a karate or a judo, but having a physical health, which is healthy, and you are actively into physical exercise, keeps you always fit to self-defense yourself in terms of trouble, right? Yes, ma'am. Since we are sitting home, uh, so it's better one hour, at least one hour, doing some workouts or something. Yeah, that will improve our physical. I mean, physical fitness, uh, it's not about uh, body shaming, right? So there's two different Mm -hmm. things. People today feel that, oh my God, Mm -hmm. I don't look him as the other one or I don't look so good as the other one right so is that is a mm-hmm. consciousness so mm-hmm. if you start taking up self-defense and physical health from that angle then you're not mentally productive but if you're taking it from the health consciousness you know mm-hmm. of why you have to be productively engaging yourself to be physically fit because being physically mm-hmm. fit means that you are more healthy in terms mm-hmm. of health you are more engaging and you don't get tired to do things, right? So that makes you much yeah. more healthy person, an active person. And that is the physical health that one needs to be engaged. Along with it, uh, if it becomes a part of your habit and a daily routine, then it is importantly that it, it can be out of choice, right? So being out of choice is the choices then, you know? And each one of us can have physical activity in different way. Like for me, I love to walk, I love to run. And that has been part and parcel from my school days till today. It's a, just an engagement. 
Uh, I love different sports that I would engage myself very actively before, but now running and walking is part of my physical activity that I do regularly. So it's, it can be anything, you know. Exactly, ma'am. Uh, next question. Ma'am, how Northeastern states lack when uh, compared to the other states and why? Uh, I think, uh, I mean, that question, um, le let me answer it from the positive lens. Hmm. Uh, geographically, we are hmm. the terrain that connects the country by the chicken neck, right? So hmm. when we look at that aspect, we have more international borders surrounding us. So the question is, we are more connecting to Southeast Asia from the geographical location, mm. but politically, we are part of India. The mm. understanding of the rest of the country on the region itself, I think, needs to have more engagement and larger engagement to understand that we are landlocked areas, you know, all of all the eight states of the Northeast. Sometimes we are being looked at eight states, you know, as a whole, but the eight state has... Mm -hmm. Eight different state eight with different cultures and different, uh, you know, I mean, I would say, belief, I mean, the culture itself is so diverse, right? So we come from different mm -hmm. tribes, tribes. So it's not that they're lacking, but it's a con the connectivity itself. You know, it's one of the challenge, the engagement yeah. that we are in, in an area where you have more cross borders rather than, you know, so we have to look at from the geographical locations and uh, mm -hmm. looking at of its engagement, but we always feel that if economic is not growing in the right direction, then we have more unsafe migration happening from the region. So you don't you don't know the northeast more, but you know the northeast more from situation that people from the region are facing in the met metropolitan cities, whether it's racism, exploitation, people don't know about you know, the people and who we are and, and the kind of culture we come from. So it needs to have more engagement, you know. And I think in a world of technology, if we have positive engagement, then we get to know the country much more better. Then we have to have more cultural uh, understanding, uh, you know, which actually engage in much more, you know, that India is a diverse country. And in that diversity, mm -hmm. we should have tolerance, you know. So tolerance will definitely exactly. raise us so, you know, that's how racism can, you know, can actually be taken okay. out if we have tolerance. Uh, our next question. Ma'am, how you spot the trafficker? Uh, when, we, when we look at from the past experience, I mean, leering of people, you know, a trafficker could be anybody. It could be a friend. It could be somebody you know very well. It could be somebody mm -hmm. uh, you meet all the time who would be luring with opportunities. So unless until you mm -hmm. check credential of these opportunity, you could be trapped by that individual who happens to be engaged as a trafficker. But if you're looking today from the context of the new challenges of trafficking, then somebody who is trying to engage with you on the social media platform who does not know you, but wants to reach out to you and wants to engage with you and seems to know you so well, then you have to be cautious of that because the kind of cases that we are mm -hmm. receiving, like I just mentioned earlier, is that artificial intelligence that is being created to, to study the algorithms of you know, markets, market analysis, and how you engage people of the likes and dislikes that push things. So that today, once you click one app, right? that you like a certain kind of travel, you will have all kind of advertisement coming to you because that's how the machine learning does. But now trafficker yeah. use that space, you know, in connecting to you and trying to uh, study that trends. And that's how yeah. vulnerable it takes place. So you could just find a trafficker engaging you in dialogue and discussion offering you opportunities online and you feel this is out of the world and it makes you feel so special. So you need to be disengaging and more cautious about things that how traffickers today are using uh, the internet space to lure people. Uh, our next question. 
Ma'am, what do you advise women to be strong and bold enough to face any sort of situation? I always believe in gender equity, you know, and uh, not about just equity for me is that men and women might be physically, you know, um, you cannot actually look biologically, right? We are both different. Yeah. But when we're looking at it from the context of strength in terms of mm -hmm. emotional and, and in terms of skills, in terms of everything around, we are equal. It, you know, I mean, so that if you have to be bold and strong, it's about first accepting yourself that as a woman, you might be completely biologically different from a man or any other gender. But at the same time, I have to be bold enough to do things and that's an underestimate yeah. my strength you know strength is not something about gender it's about gender. how you do things right so strength is never about gender you know a man can cry a woman can cry right so there's no issues about disparities out there right so it's it's all about how you define that role and uh being bold mean accepting that biologically we are different but uh, we are strength and our capacity, uh, our you know, skill sets can still be in the same line and we can still be bold enough and competitive enough to do things. So we don't have to go and mark our space out there and say, you have to give a space for me. You always have to say, I have a space out there and I'll prove it that I can do it. There is a lot of prejudices already being created. We have to break all that prejudices and combat. I mean, sometimes I think a women create a lot of inner prejudices on themselves that I'm not capable, I'm not able yeah. to do it. Uh, I don't think I'll be giving a platform to do it. So that itself, you know, pulls you down from the strength that you could have built to do things, you know. So it's important to take away all those kind of, of mindset that you have within yourself and try. I know I'm not saying that it's easy. It is challenging mm -hmm. because culturally yeah, the patriarchal world always sees men as, you know, the stronger version of how culturally we have been tuned and, and, and being taken to grow up and believe that there's a disparity between men and women. But I think I come from a matrilineal society, you know, uh, where my lineage is through the mother, my surname is through my mom. I didn't grow up like that. And I think today the world needs to learn so much from a matrilineal system about equity. It's about participatory. It's about what men and women are the same. And uh, that's how you, you cope up to be more stronger uh, because it allows you to take those roles uh, to be more bold, to try it out. You know, being bold means being innerly strong uh, to strong. believe in what you want to do and yourself. Our next question. What are the basic tools one must have to carry to defend themselves? Basic tools. Um, when we talk about defense ourselves, um, you have to really build a strong willpower in your mind because that is the inner strength that help you to defend yourself from any external adversity that comes to you in making you feel down and small. That's very important. And when you talk about physical, I think we meant, I mentioned earlier, it's about being healthy and strong enough, you know, and um, being able to defend oneself and be cautious of where you are and where you're going. Uh, you know, because you cannot say that I'm a woman, I'm bold, I can go anywhere. You also have to look at culturally context in which part of the world you are and which place you are. And bold meaning being cautious, bold being practical. Bold, it means that you have to be cautious of where you are so that you're protecting yourself and being bold enough to take this action, right? Exactly, ma'am. Our next question. Ma'am, what are the steps that need to be implemented by the government to stop these harassment and trafficking cases? Uh, in context of India, we have Immoral Trafficking Prevention Act as a law, and we have many subsequent laws that has emerged, whether it's the Juvenile Justice Act, whether it's POXO, 
you know, and sexual harassment in the workplace, all of these, you know, uh, I mean, Domestic Violence Bill Act, I mean, all of these are existing. Now, it's all about how much are we aware of the law that is existing and how mm -hmm. much are we coming forward to apply those law in the right direction when it's required? And how much do we engage to educate ourselves about those laws? You know, so if we don't educate ourselves about those laws and we don't want to know about how it functions and how we can get access to justice, definitely the laws remain to be in its place, but we are not mm. uh, allowing those laws to protect our rights. So it's very important to educate and build the capacity and learning. Our next question. Ma'am, uh, there are few circumstances which make people depressed rather than uh, defending themselves. How to overcome these situations? Good question. Uh, Self-depression or being depressed, uh, it's actually a, a, a very big term, okay? Because at the end of the day, each one of us has, you know, different uh, personality, different inner strength, and different... Uh, growth experiences, you know, so it depends mm -hmm. on how you grew up as a child that helps you to be able to fight the kind of depression you go through. That's an important element mm -hmm. one needs to recognize. And sometimes mm -hmm. some of us has the ability, you know, to fight back those form of depression that allow that actually affects our life that makes our life vulnerable in the way we perform things, the way we engage ourselves, in the way mm. we are out to the world. Now, if you feel that there are these situations that is actually depressing, and we are not able to overcome by talking to our close and dear ones, you know, our family members that we can trust, or friends that we can trust, then do not hesitate to go to a professional mm. help because a professional help is a way forward to guide you to overcome those situations that is actually making you depressed and not performing and not being able to tackle whether personal career or all kind of emotional growth. So it depends on individual to individual experiences. Uh, some of us don't need those help because uh, we take refuge uh, in uh, actually doing things that are making us happier, engaging in hobbies, engaging in performing, engaging into what we love the most, all of that. Some of us are unable to do that. You know, we use substance abuse to, to help counter those problems. But once we know that we have crossed the line and we are not able to help ourselves, then it's time for us to actually take help, professional help. And that's very important and it's never too late. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, mental uh, strength is depending on person. So we have to be ready if we are feeling low. We have to be ready to just take the professional help, and we don't want to feel shy or ashamed on that. That is the main. Yeah, thing. I mean, uh, it's Let's important. I mean, like one has to analyze how much is our depression affecting us. How much are we are. Uh, disengaging ourselves from the outside world. What is actually affecting us in our day-to-day -day life? If you find that it's becoming a pattern in our life every day, and we are engaging ourselves either in substance abuse or other engagement mm -hmm. which is not helping us to grow and function, you know, normally, like a normal person, then it's time to talk about it and never hesitate to talk about it. And today, there are all forms of help available, you know, and seeking a psychological help is not, nothing wrong at all. It's just being human. Yeah. And being human is helping yourself because you want to move ahead and disengage on things that are affecting you. And maybe what is affecting you has a lot to do with your childhood, with your personal experiences, your relationship experiences, at any level of it. And if you're not being able to come forward and you're actually in a pattern of engaging into depression and being depressed and not being able to overcome or detach, like I just use the word detach from the situation, then always go for professional help. 
uh, a next question what is your advice to those who are not comfortable to speak about the problem openly with others then you have to go to a professional help that keeps a confidentiality of what you are undergoing emotionally professionally you know at any level uh, mm -hmm. so that you're able to speak out what actually is affecting you that's the only one if you're not comfortable <laughs> <laughs> uh one more question ma'am uh, didn't you even faced any criticism or any failures after sharing the evolutionary uh revolution steps well i think um i had always taken criticism uh as a way of mastering and engaging myself further mm -hmm. and win over by performing better and i think i grew up with that concept and practice of course i will not deny that as a young person there has been criticism uh, that i was facing uh, where you know, it was affecting me at the personal level when i come back home but then i took it very in a, a personal strike to myself that when people said that i cannot write then i asked myself do i have to prove to them that i cannot write or do i engage myself in writing because i love to write should i practice to write more and should i basically engage myself in writing again and again and again and do better i was criticized in the beginning that how can i call myself a poet i never call myself a poet i wrote it because i was expressing my uh, my myself i was expressing my experiences and if that took me to different levels of being a poet i accepted that i grew over time and i met wonderful people who have engaged me into that whole process so it's about disengaging from that criticism which actually uh takes you away from performing uh what you feel that you love to that's one part of how i overcome criticism the other is that when i was you know i faced criticism in the innovation of how we were trying to address human trafficking and for me is uh trying to for to search for a better solution and using the legal lens help the evolvement of the impulse model to all criticism that we got in the past till it become a world innovation and we got the world innovation prize so for me is criticism leads to make me work harder and i'm always taking that so i felt that the more i get criticized i grow more because i work extra hard you know i search for extra solution and i i would spend that people would say oh i'm a workaholic <laughs> but it's not about being a workaholic it's about engaging myself in what i believe very strongly and finding the right directive and direction you know for the way of putting it ahead to the world Yes, ma'am. We can't live in others' uh, expectations, so we live well, in our own dreams and passion. You are ethically doing what is right. So for me, uh, working on human rights spaces, creating innovation to address human right, it's about being ethical. Because when you are ethical and you do things that is right legally, and you're emotionally giving your best, you know, and participating into it. i come back sleeping soundly every night if that is what it does to you then uh nothing no criticism will affect you but if you know that you have not done ethically and you are actually involved in unethical ways of doing things definitely when you come back you know the self awareness within yourself you're not being able to sleep right so that is then you need to take a turning point and ask question to yourself what should i do and how do i improve myself exactly so here comes uh, the end of the today's session uh, audience watching over there they know how much informative was the session ma'am how are you feeling after the session mean after the interactive session how are you feeling about this how one hour well uh, it's nice to be talking to a young platform uh interview by a young person that reminds me of when i was just 17 eagerly to do something different you know being a change maker 
So it just take me back to being 17 and my college days, uh, trying to create spaces of innovation. And here, I'm, here I am with you and your team of young people going backwards and forward in my journey and expressing my experiences. So it's been a wonderful conversation. Thank you. I'm so glad to hear this from you, ma'am. Ma'am, this, this session was really inspiring and I heartily thank you on behalf of my team uh, for accepting our invitation and giving your you know, time, precious time from your busy schedule. All the best wishes for your further adventures from our team, ma'am. This would be a memorable experience in drive time with you, ma'am. Thank you so much thank for this platform. And I say, you all connected to me through my Instagram page. So I, I would say the social media space can also have positive interaction and it can have positive engagement, uh, you know? So that's another way of, of saying thank you. And uh, to all the young people listening to me there, I would say that start to follow your dreams, but have resilience on your dream. And when you start taking your dream forward as a young person, you might make many mistakes, but as a young person, uh, the mistake always take you to the next level. And it's always good to start young because as young people, you don't mind the mistake you make because you know that you can again grow. As you grow older, you calculate too much. So sometimes, even if you have dreams, you, you tend to keep that aside and you don't put it forward. But uh, happy holidays to everybody. Merry Christmas, happy new year as you know, in the next few days. And I hope 2022 becomes uh, a different um time for the new I mean new kind of life that we all are leading and I hope we engage in more positively thank you thank you ma'am with this great message this is Rehina bin Muhammad signing off